morning, everybody. I don't know if I can match a Lady Gaga-inspired entrance, but thank you to the conference organisers um, for setting the bar high, and I, I hope to exceed expectation beyond doubt. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be invited to be your MC for today's conference, and what an important conference it is around strengthening disability advocacy and doing disability differently. Now, you might be wondering, just why have the conference organisers invited me to be your MC? And that's because, delegates, I've spent many years of my life doing things differently, challenging attitudes and perceptions of the way we view people with disability. And in order to do that, I thought to myself, now what do I bring to this conversation that provides that unique perspective? Well, I'm also a proud gay man, an occasional drag queen. I'm a failed beauty pageant entrant, <laughs> a failed reality television wannabe contestant, and I also happen to be, just for balance, although to be perfectly honest with you, I don't have a great deal of that. I'm a person with disability. I myself have cerebral palsy. And so it gives me great pleasure and pride to be your MC this, throughout today. And I'm from Canberra. So thank you very much to the organisers for rescuing me from the recent chaos that's been occurring just across the lake from my apartment as I view, appear up towards Parliament House. And I think, thank goodness, I'm not there. I'm in beautiful Melbourne and it's a privilege to be here. Can I too um, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land and to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that join us for today's conference. Today is very important because each and every one of you in this room, what you do is simply expert, and important. What you do is important. And this conference brings us together to challenge the many ideas, perce perceptions and perspectives that are in our community, to challenge us to think about new ways to do the important work that we do. So I look forward to getting to know many of you throughout the day and certainly having many conversations with you. Before we get started, I just want to do the housekeeping. Um, I'm not very good at that at my house, but um, I have to be good at that today. Because unlike in Canberra, my pledge to you is to provide unwavering, consistent, stable leadership. <laughs> I will be predictable. You won't see any leadership changes under my watch. <laughs> However, it's important that we do housekeeping. So you'll notice that um, today the agenda is packed full of exciting presentations and perspectives, and I look forward to being part of that conversation today as well. But importantly, we do have meal breaks, and so I can assure you that morning tea will be served at 11 o'clock for 30 minutes, followed by lunch at 12.30, where we'll break for an hour, and afternoon tea at 2.30 for 30 minutes. In the event of a fire, you might hear me squeal, <laughs> but in the interest of our safety, I'm proud to say that a fire warden will attend and cope much better under the stress than I perhaps would. <laughs> the fire warden will attend, who will provide us with the instructions on how to exit the building safely. Please follow those instructions at all times in the event of an emergency. For those of you who use Twitter, not me, Facebook or Instagram, I'm on Instagram, follow me, please, please tweet and join the conversation about our conference today. Your input, your views and perspectives and opinions are important to us and they're important to me too. Um, so if I can ask you to use the hashtag SDAC18, 
on all of your social media tweets and contributions, that would be great because we will be collecting all of your tweets and Facebook comments and have them live streamed throughout the conference. There are also some amazing postcards that I will collect because I've prepared a demonstration. There are some amazing postcards that are on your tables. They look like this. I'm not a hand model, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> These are two I prepared earlier. I'll read the feedback on them already. Um, but they're on your table for you to, throughout the day, write down your feedback. And what we will do is collect them at, throughout the day. Write down your ideas for change, thoughts and feedback on all uh, contributors to the conference because your views and perspectives matter to us. And just in the interest of the postcards, I do have two that I prepared earlier. And luckily for me, they're feedback for me says, Wayne, you're already doing a fabulous job. Your hair looks great and you walk with so much sass, so much more than Joel Creasy. Love, Mum. I'll have to pay her for that later. But today, delegates, it gives me great pleasure to captain the ship today for our conference. Thank you for being here. By being here, it shows that inclusion and the importance of putting people with disability at the centre of our political, social and community conversation matters to so many. And it is a privilege for me to be a small part of that in beautiful Melbourne today. I would like to get our formal proceedings underway. And in order to do that, I would like to invite Mr. Perry Wanden, a Wiradjuri elder, to do our welcome to country. Thank you very much. Take a step away from the... Good morning, everybody. That wasn't bad, Wayne. I'll tell you what, he does a good job. You're going to have a great day today. Firstly, I'd like to pay respects to all elders, both past, present, and elders here today, possible, hopefully, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and of course, our next generation coming through. As you heard, my name's Perry Wandon. I'm very proud to be here, Wurundjeri man. Uh, I followed the footsteps of my father. He's passed now 12 years. He was our Narangita, meaning head man. His name was James Duby Wandon. Uh, first Aboriginal player to play for that mighty team, St Kilda. So I hope there's a few around. We always get one or two. <laughs> Thank you, we've got a couple. Well, I'm happy. I go home with a big smile. And our family's pretty, pretty well one-eyed St Kilda too. Um, and how my father got there was uh, passed down through uh, generation, being the oldest male. And uh, back in 1863 in this beautiful town of Melbourne... How everything was going bad and wrong and uh, trying to drive Aboriginal people out, if not by the gun, and being shot. Common cold was killing our people. And they were all pushed out to a beautiful place in Hillsville up there in the Yarra Valley, which my family still lives. We were there, well, they were pushed up there, sorry, with nothing, locked in um, a mission, as they called it back those days, Corrandirk Mission. It was pretty well much a main centre focus because of Melbourne. And there was Simon Wonga was the main leader there. Um, and like I said, back in 1863, they had nothing. They built their own bar cuts. They had people that uh, made sure they didn't escape. And by 1924, from 35, 32, 35 women and children, don't forget, to over 400. And don't forget there was other mobs that were brought in as well, and they were all locked up in one place. When Simon Wonga passed on, his, that was in 1872, passed it on to my great-great-great-uncle, William Barrick. William Barrick, he's uh, very much so... I'd possibly say he was a leader of Aboriginal people back then because what he did, 
he had to get a permission slip to walk in, and the same as what you're doing today, is trying to get better rights for disabled people. And look, I commend you. Look, it's it's great. It's there is nothing you can't say wrong, uh, especially with Wayne. I can see you're going to go straight forward with that. But um, as I was saying, we and Barrick walked two days in, permission, with a slip. And then he walked with other elders to walk into Melbourne Parliament House, banged on the door, got to see some people and asked for one, can I have another clothing, shoes for the children and another blanket for our bed? We only had one. And usually he went back with empty handed. So it was a two day back walk. And then that sort of started and got newspaper happening, going Aboriginals are asking for this, for that. Excuse me, um, just the common medicine because all the, the meat, the flour, sugar was being laced. So our people were going down very quickly. William Barrick, uh, we just found out too, William Barrick's got paintings over in Switzerland. Uh, that lovely man, Adolf Hitler, must have thought he'd done something right because he grabbed two of them. And we're in the process of trying to get him back. So that says a lot of stories. So that means... William Barrick has done something for Aboriginal people in Victoria because I know when he first started to go in and he kept continually going back and forth to uh, Parliament House, the newspapers were getting bigger and bigger and all the other missions in Victoria were sort of following suit, writing letters and writing letters. And as I said, when I shut down in 1924, most of our family went down to Lake Ties and our family stayed in Hurlsville. But um, as I was saying, William Barrick was there till 1903. Beautiful age, uh, 85. He passed it on to my great-grandfather, Robert Wandoon. Uh, you know my name's Wandon. Uh, they just changed it, took out two O's and put in an I. Why, we don't know. We'll never find out. My great-grandfather was uh, half-caste. And he, we still don't know who his father was, a white man, of course. And... What the elders did back then, the women, they threw him in the Yarra because they thought we can't have a half-caste running Aboriginal people in a mission. So the farmer seen that, come back, brought him back and sat everyone down like this and said, look, these are the rules, you've got to follow them, you just can't do that. And as, like I said, William Barrick passed it on to my great-grandfather, Robert Wandoon, and he led his way until he got sick too because of all genocide that was happening in the mission. He died a young man of 53. So, and as I said, 1924, and there was a long break. 1985, Wurundjeri became a land council corporation. We will be changing our name soon. We'll be going to the Woiwurrung Aboriginal Corporation because uh, the government says we're not fully inclusive of other family groups. But... Uh, we're trying our best to try and help the government. They don't help us. One door opens and another one shuts. But as I was saying, since 1984, 85, we're very strong. We love to do what we uh, are achieving with our cultural heritage because every time we find something in the ground, stone artefact, it tells us another story and it leads where all our history has mainly been verbal now we're putting it into books to tell everybody our story. You've heard my story. I'm very proud to come out and uh, tell you. I'm also Aboriginal Heritage Officer. I was the third one in Victoria uh, a few years back. But um, now there are up to about a dozen. So we've got more control over our heritage on, in the ground, on the ground and above the ground, especially our people walking around. My mother was English, as you can see, my beautiful colour. I get burnt like everyone else, thank you. Uh, and I think I've got a bit of legacy on that side because my, great, my grandfather was Harry Potter. So I've got something on both sides of the family. Maybe I can wave that magical wand one day and it might happen. Yeah, well, either that or throw it at him, one or the other. No, we're not like that. But anyway, look, I thank you to listen to my story. In our Wurrung language, we're Minjaka, Yemen Kundibik, Wurundjeri Bullock meaning welcome to the land of Wurundjeri people, and I hope you have a great day, and I hope you kick some goals. Thank you.
Thank you, Perry, for that um, great welcome. Um, it is so important that um, all people, including our First Nations people, are centred to conversations around disability and inclusion. I'd now like to move to our next session, which is um, an address from Professor David Haywood. Um, Professor David Haywood is from our conference sponsor, Future Social Service Institute. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you, Gabrielle. And um, I did want to begin with a couple of acknowledgements. First of all, thank you very much, Perry, for the um, welcome to country. Uh, every time I hear you speak, I learn more and more about um, some of the terrible things that have happened in the past and every reason why we should be proud about our Indigenous people. Um, but I also wanted to uh, also make the point that the land on which we um, meet today has never been ceded. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to acknowledge that point. Um, also, Gabrielle, congratulations to you uh, and your government for what I think has been the most successful period of social policy reform for many years, and I think we should acknowledge that. Um, uh, sincerely. Um, Wayne, I noticed your comment that you were thinking about, you acknowledged how great Victoria's reform credentials were. You should come and move down here. It's a really great place to be, and uh, Minister Foley's uh, contribution in driving that reform agenda should be acknowledged. Um, also, uh, the Victorian Government has got through the Registration accredit Accreditation Scheme for Disability Workers, first state to do that, and I think that's a major innovation and recognition of the significance of that workforce. And the $50 million carers package just announced the other day is another significant recognition recognition of the work that's done in the sector. Um, but uh, this isn't about the, uh, the Labor Government of Victoria, it's really about the, the conference and we're delighted to be the sponsor of the conference today. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the, um, the Institute was formed, there's a partnership between the Victorian Council of Social Service and RMIT and it's got one, one or really two things um, uh, that it focuses upon with, with support from the Victorian Government. Um, Workforce and enterprise. Uh, workforce because the fastest growing part of the labour force, for, the, for as far as the eye can see, is going to be healthcare and social assistance. For the next five years, it's going to grow by a quarter of a million people. A quarter of a million people. It's a staggering growth. Now, a large chunk of that growth is going to be the disability workforce. Um, it's got to go from about 40,000 last year to about 80,000 next year. So it's massive growth. And it raises questions about how are we going to get people to move into the sector? What are we going to do to make it the place to be? You may have noticed that yesterday the uh, federal government's aged care workforce task force presented its final report to the government. It was publicly released. And they're saying that what needs to happen, we need to significantly increase pay, we need to significantly increase recognition, we need to significantly improve the qualifications, and we need to significantly improve public recognition of what is a fantastic workforce in, in, the, in its contribution to society. Um, I'd like you to, to think about those, those points and the, uh, the strength with which they're made. Now, they're being made with respect to one part of this massive one, over 1.4 million people uh, workforce. It's the aged care workforce. And the bit that we tend to forget, the bit that we tend to forget is the disability workforce. Um, <clears throat> and now, without a very strong disability workforce, um, the NDIS will struggle. I think we'll all struggle into the future. Um, and what we're keen to see at the Future Social Service Institute is further investment in education and training. Uh, we think it's essential that the workforce is properly um, educated and trained with pathways, careers uh, and full recognition. Uh, one of the things we've been doing at the Institute this year, which I'm really proud of, we've offered seven scholarships with um, VicDef to uh, deaf people to come and do our course. And it's with a view to try to include disabled people into the classroom Room. Next year I'd hope that we extend into uh, people with other forms of disability. Um, if we succeed, the wonderful thing about that, if we succeed, the wonderful thing is, is that the curriculum becomes the classroom as you get a fully inclusive curriculum. And wouldn't it be fantastic if we saw the NDIS as a way in which we increase the employment rates of people with disability, which remains staggeringly low. Um, <clears throat> so, but look, that's what we're about. Um, today isn't about us, it is about you. I do hope you enjoy uh, your, your time today. I did want to acknowledge um, Melissa and Natasha, who are fantastic advocates for advocacy. 
great stuff. Congratulations. Um, to all of you, do have a wonderful day, and I look forward to being one of the people who listen to all the fantastic things that are said. Thank you very much for listening. David, can I extend my thanks on behalf of everyone at the conference for um, your sponsorship of the event? And certainly, you demonstrated a key driver in the participation of people with disability during your speech. That is, you offered me a job. (laughs) You demonstrated just how easy it is to ensure the economic and social participation of people with disability, and I'm happy to have a chat over morning tea about what my job might be. But thank you very much to the Social Services Institute for your sponsorship.